Now, very good morning to uh, Dubbo Region Mayor Matthew Dickerson. Hello, sir. A very good morning to you too, Brett. It's nice to see you. You're Thank all you. dressed up, raring to go like you always are every day. Could you imagine me in a suit and tie? That's a long time ago. I used to wear <laughs> one of those. Uh, I'm sure you occasionally put a suit and tie on. That's it, but I'd have to shave to make it all uh, look nice as well there, Matt. Thanks for popping into the studio. We like to catch up with you every fortnight here at CFM, and I think it's really important that we do that because our community members need to know what's happening at council. Now, a couple of things which leads me into that statement is you've won an award for communications during COVID. Congratulations for the team. Let's talk about that. Yeah. But also, there's probably room for improvement, do you think? Well, that's right. I think the congratulations go to our communications team. So we had a couple of the team down there on Thursday night. We picked up that award. That's a local government New South Wales award. And that was really around the communications focus during COVID. You had to put in some examples of how the communications team had done a wonderful job. So there are different categories, as most award functions you'd understand. So there was a category for communications, and they have three different size councils, below 30,000 population, 30,000 to 70,000, which is obviously where Dubbo fits in, mm -hmm. and then above 70,000. So we got the highly commended award, so they gave a first place award. We didn't get that. We got the highly commended award, so call it second place if you like. And a number of councils had all the finalists in the program, and so there were a number of finalists in there, and, and I can't remember, but probably five or six different finalists they selected for our particular category and then they got that highly commended for that. And that really is a real pat on the back for the team and we're talking about the staff there that did a great job during COVID-19. So I wasn't there at the time so I can't take any credit for that. But it really focuses on something else that I've often talked about and that's communication. And even when I came back in as mayor this time I said one of the things that I really want to focus on is communications and when I say that I say internal and external communications. I mm. think the communications needed to improve internally, councillors and council staff. You really rely on the staff for their expertise, their knowledge. We've got a huge amount of expertise in the staff body and you need to be able to listen to that and have discussions with those staff at a professional level, not at an attacking level. Mm. So you need to be able to have councillors sit around, talk to the staff, understand things, whatever might be happening at the time, really get an understanding because ultimately, Despite all of that expertise, despite all of that knowledge that we have in our staff, ultimately it's the council resolution, it's the council decision that carries the day. So the decisions are made by councillors. And so you need to take responsibility for those decisions that councillors make. Despite all the best advice, you sometimes have to ask the right question. And I know Dr Carl often says the Nobel Prizes aren't won by the people who answer the questions, it's the people who ask the correct questions, first of all, mm. to be able to answer those questions. So asking questions is really important. I think we felt here at the radio station, I'll talk from our experience, that uh, communication with council went to one person, and that was the, the mayor at the time, and it was all filtered through the mayor, so we were getting pretty similar conversations all the time. So whether that was intended or not, I don't know, but I, I don't think from a broadcasting experience from our side that that's, that's a bit dangerous, I think, because that means we can't talk to individual people. Um, sometimes, you know, maybe an organisation wants to do that. What was the purpose behind that, do you know? Yeah, I'll give you a little bit of history on that. And let me just go back one step. The second part that I talked about mm. when I came back in as mayor was that communications with our community needed to improve. So right. we needed to make sure that in the community, generally, people had an idea of what was going on at council, to be engaged, to be involved. And the point you make there, one of the first comments I received from a radio station, it wasn't you in particular, but a radio announcer, said, can you please lift the ban on radio stations and the media being able to speak to other councillors and mm. the staff across the board. And I kind of was a bit confused, said, what do you mean the ban? And they said, the mayor of the day said that he was the only one mm. that could allow people to speak to the media and everything had to be exactly as said through that particular person. Now, I encourage my councillors to go out there and have opinions, encourage my councillors to go out there, and they're not my councillors, I shouldn't say that, sorry, encourage the councillors, the, the Dubbo Regional Council councillors, to go out there and have conversations with the media, to talk to people about their opinions, to say what their opinions are, but also the staff are allowed to talk to media. And it was a bit funny when some of the staff were getting phone calls from the media mm. early on, and I'm talking about early on in my time back as mayor, they were saying, oh, are we allowed to talk to the media again? And yes, of course you I are. I still think that happens a little bit. I know talking with Richard, who's on our sister station, and he does most of the legwork there, yeah. but I know that some of uh, the staff are still a little bit hesitant, and perhaps that's because it happened for a long time. But I still it, think it that's... Might, that's might be right, it might be a bit of a hangover there. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And there's, but there's certainly no direction from myself or the mm. CEO that there is any ban there. To limit that. Yeah, yeah that's right. We, we encourage 
media outlets to talk to whoever they need to talk to about whatever it might be. So if you've got water issues, you might need to talk to some of the experts in that particular department. If you've got issues with the roads, there might mm. be some people in that particular area. Certainly, technically, the mayor is the spokesperson for resolutions of council, but it doesn't mean that's the only person that can talk. That's just the, the rules as such, if you like, around mm. that spokesperson. But no, I encourage media outlets to talk to different people we have in council. I know that happens at the moment, and, and I encourage that to keep happening. But from my perspective, really important thing for me is to make sure that I'm on your radio station every fortnight. I'm on other radio stations. I won't mention any names, of course, on your radio station, but other radio stations across the city. Uh, I even do things outside the city, even Bathurst and Burke mm. and various radio stations around the region. It's really important that people have an idea of what's going on and also just understand there is that open flow of communication. So winning a communications award, yes, I know it was for something specific, but we've got that team that was involved in that particular process, they're still there. So they're still doing a great job with their communications and we want to communicate whatever it is, the good, the bad, the ugly, because here's the important thing, Brett, I don't own council. Mm. You own council, the community owns council. So it's really important that you know what's going on because it's your council. Mm. So hiding things from the community would just be crazy because it's not mine. It's not my little private business that I can just do what I want with, For I'm sure. doing what you want with. I think last uh, last election, we, we proved that we are in council, right? That we had <laughs> to right. say because that was a, a bit of a difference. Now, you talk about hiding things. Uh, Regan Park has come up controversially at the minute. Some people suggesting in the community, residents and the like, that council has already got a master plan in place and perhaps there's some secrets going on there. Is that correct? I th no, it's not. And I think they're imposing some of the old council thoughts onto this council. One of the big issues there is about a resolution that went through council in February last year, which obviously wasn't this group of councils. This council was elected in December last year. So February last year, there was a resolution of council that talked about St. John's Junior Rugby League and 10 hectares of land at Regan Park for them to basically investigate utilising that. And that was done with no consultation. That was done with no discussion with the community. It was mm. a mere or minute dropped on. It was supported by a council in terms of it was a resolution of council. And that obviously uh, put a few noses there to join. And I must admit at the time, I thought, wow, that was interesting. There was no consultation there. I wonder why that didn't happen in that normal, correct way. Jump forward to this year, the first, the very first meeting of this new council, uh, what's called the ordinary council meeting in January this year. So a new group of councillors together. The first thing that happened is one of the notices of motion from councillors was we need to go back and investigate a master plan. Because there was a master plan for Regan Park way back in 2013, mm -hmm. and I thought it was quite a good master plan. You can't go and utilise that now because part of that master plan had a velodrome and a criterium track for cyclists there. Well, that's already been built now. So you'd have to change that master plan regardless. The previous council rescinded that master plan, said it was no good, throw it away. So in, in their process, they did that for whatever reason. I can't explain exactly why they did that, but that was what they did. So at the moment, there is no master plan because it was rescinded, the last one. So this council said, we need a master plan for not just Regan Park, but let's look at that river corridor. So the south area where Regan Park is, so basically south of the LH Broad Bridge, and the north area, which is basically north of Erskine Street, those two areas are being done. Now, we went out to firms, qualified firms that can do this sort of thing, and we picked one of those, and we've given them the job and said, please go and tell us, you've essentially got a blank sheet of paper. Now, they'll look at a whole range of past plans and all sorts of things to come up with that. But we've said, you go and work out how this corridor should look for the betterment of Dubbo. Now, again, some people have been saying, oh, no, there's a done deal. It's hidden behind closed doors, all the rest of it. Well, it's just all crazy talk, if you like, because there's no done deal there. There's no discussions that we've had that have locked things in. People have asked to see plans. There's no plans with overlays. I've seen an overlay. I saw an overlay that a, a local architect posted on social media that said, mm. here's what it would look like with sporting ovals on that particular piece of land. But we're waiting for that consultancy process to play out. Can those critics, um, you know, suggest things? Can we suggest things? Absolutely Can right. everyone suggest anything? Absolutely right. So that's where we're at at the moment. We're in a consultancy. So this consultancy mm. firm is going through and talking to the public. They've held a couple of workshops already. They've got more workshops to go. You can just email them directly. So you've got this process in place that is exactly what we do. It's public consultation. We did the same thing for the first Regan Park Master Plan back in 2013 and obviously leading up to 2013 when the final resolution of council. And funnily enough, Murray Wood was the director at the time and I was the mayor at the time. 
jump forward to now, we've got Murray Wood as the CEO and myself as mayor. So the process is going to be very similar to what happened way back then. And the outcome from that, people were very happy with the outcome from that. So but, yes. But people, no secrets. I don't have any secrets. Nothing there. locked in. I've got nothing locked in at all. I've okay. got no secret plans. And I don't know any councillors have got any secret plans there. We really are saying to the community, don't get wound up about something that might be happening or that you've convinced yourself that's hidden away there. Engage in the consultancy process. That's what we have this open public consultation for. And even once they finish, Brett, they'll do the public consultation. They'll go through that process. They'll bring that to council. We'll see some plans. We'll then put that through a council meeting. Then it will go out for formal public consultation. Once there are some draft plans, draft being the important word there, then we'll take feedback from the community on the draft plans, and then we'll finally come back to council to be finally resolved by council what the plan is. That process won't finish till next year. And probably don't believe everything on social media that you read. Don't believe everything on social media you read, and just have some conversation with some councillors. And I know some people are doing that, but mm. people are getting wound up about something. There really there is no reason to be wound up about it. Let the process play out. Engage in the process abusing councillors, abusing council, making all sorts of wild accusations doesn't help the public consultation process. Let the process occur, engage in that process. That's, I can't stress that enough, Brett. Engage in the process because that's what we want people to do. We want people to engage in that consultation process. There's a report that will, go, will be out today that will go to our committee meetings for Thursday night that gives an update on where that process is up to just to lay out here's the process, here's what it's up to. Again, there's no specific plan in there. It's really talking about how the consultancy process is, is going so far, mm. what the future consultancy involves, and letting people engage in that process further. But engage, engage, engage. It doesn't help anyone to just make wild accusations. When's consultation finished? When, when can we stop giving our ideas? So the, I don't know the exact date off the top of my head. I know there are further consultations through in September. Okay. So it's not finishing for... So still a little bit of time. Yeah, that's right. There's at least another month or probably two months to go of that, but I, I haven't got the exact date off the top of my head. Sorry, no, Brett, on that's that fine. Yeah. Um, speaking of communication, I want to know, how did the water treatment plant in our reservoirs hold up after this latest flooding event? Of course, we're still in the midst of that, and yeah. I can see the Macquarie River still pretty full and uh, bulging there from the sides. But but do you think the communication process, you've done okay through this, or is there room for improvement with that as well? Always room for improvement in anything we do. Certainly in terms of the latest flood event, there were a couple of things there. Our water treatment, obviously we learned from the last time with our water treatment, and we actually shut down our water treatment plant at one stage. Our reservoirs were all full. We knew there was more turbid water coming down the river. We shut that down for a period of time just to let some of that turbid water go past. And we also learned a bit more about what we need to do to that water to make sure it's treated correctly and it, to the best possible way with this more turbid water coming down. Keeping in mind, as we've talked about, the turbidity level standards changed in November 2020. We used to have to treat water below 1.0 NTU, nephilometric turbidity units, and now, as of November 2020, that standard went to 0 0.5. So that made some change in terms of the way we had to treat that water. So I think there, no ball water alert, fantastic, and... Uh, as far as I know, there will be no boil water alert, but we'll keep working on that to make sure that doesn't happen. If it does, we will communicate that. And then in terms of the flooding, yes, as early as possible, we got information out to tell people about those flood events and bridges being closed, the pedestrian bridges, for example, at Tamworth Street and the Shibble Bridge. So getting people to know that those things are shut down. In Wellington, there were a few road closures. Getting that information out quickly is difficult because sometimes those rivers come up a bit quicker. And I saw a picture of the Bell River and I, I don't think I've ever seen the Bell River so high. That was quite incredible. And just like the last flood event a month ago, Little River was higher than I've ever seen it. Little River, you can stand on the bridge out there. I've ridden my bike across there hundreds of times. You could drop a coin and you could almost count the seconds before it hits the water or drop a rock. I wouldn't show my, my money in the river, but, but it was almost up to that bridge. So it was an incredibly high bridge or incredibly high water level there. So things are changing. There's no doubt about it. And I made a comment on Facebook just recently where I said that the climate modelling mm. says that we'll get more of these events through to December. Now, I didn't say climate change. I said climate modelling because that modelling, you can have climate modelling for a day, a week, a month, a year, whatever it might be. We know we'll have more of these events through to December this year. Is that caused by climate change? Then yes, I would say it, it is. We have got climate change. It's a reality. Sorry to break the, or burst the bubble of people out there who don't think it's a reality. But in our localised climate modelling through to December, we're going to see more of these events like we've had over the last few days where the water will subside and things will be fine and then it'll come up again and there'll be heavy rains in the area and then Burrendong Dam will 
probably release a bit of its water because we need to make sure we don't have a, a burst dam or extra flooding there. So you're regulating all of those different things. Some roads impacted Dubbo, Wellington, uh, blisters on Council's website. The Troy Bridge was uh, possibly going to be impacted, as well as the Tamworth Street footbridge that you've just <laughs> refixed and put the headrails in. That's right. They were obviously taken down pretty early this time. They were dropped. And again, we learned from that. The water came up so quickly last time, there is a process to drop those rails, but a decision was made by our staff from a safety perspective not to go under that bridge and drop those rails because the water was coming up so quickly we didn't want our staff stuck out there in the middle of the bridge so they were damaged unfortunately you're right they've just been fixed they've just been put back up but with this flood event they were dropped in time and shibble bridge has shear bolts so it can actually drop just from the pressure so a very clever design there that one was done after the Tenworth street bridge but we actually did manually drop those rails as well because even when they do drop with the shear bolts on them you can have a little bit of damage to those railings so they were dropped mainly because we knew that water was going to come up definitely and so we, we closed those a little bit earlier so you're going to learn from things as you go mm. and we're going to keep having to learn new things as our climate changes and now that we know that there's 11 reservoirs you reckon they're all full and we're all okay so no need to panic no need to panic at this stage they were all filled up before we shut the water treatment plant down. That's been fired back up again now. We can last a few days without water being treated because the reservoirs do ab allow water to flow through to our residents, but you can't go for too long without that. But it was really that first flush of that water that comes down. And keep in mind that as rain falls, our land is very saturated at the moment, mm. so you don't get much water soaking into the landscape. It is really running off almost immediately. So that's where you get some of that extra water that comes down. But at least this time as well, when the last one came down, there'd been obviously drought conditions for some time. Things like the Little River, the riverbanks on the Little River hadn't seen water up that high for a long time. So you had a lot of carcasses and feces up on that water, which brought down that highly turbid water. Even on the Macquarie, the same sort of thing. A lot of that flush happened, so this water wasn't quite as turbid as it was last time either. And the low-line bridge, uh, Jean Emil Sarissio Bridge, it didn't topple over this time, which is good news. No, and what typically happens is you've got water that comes down the river from rain events upstream, but also the state government controls how much water comes out of Burundong mm. because it wants to keep a bit of headroom in the, the dam so that you don't get water flowing over the top of it, but you also don't want to have too much flooding downstream. So typically, when they're releasing water from the dam, they're monitoring the Sarissia Bridge and keeping the level there just below that. Again, rain can be a variable in there, so you can't get it perfect all the time, but that's when you see water out of the dam to try and keep that extra headroom there without it going over the top of the Sarissia Bridge. Yes. I won't try and pronounce it as well as you did. That was perfect, the pronunciation. No, I appreciate that. Well, what <laughs> of our founding farmers, uh, founding fathers, I should say, not farmers. Well, he probably was a farmer back in the day, was he? I think he was a wine merchant, actually. Oh, was he? Think, oh, there yeah, you go. I, I think he, he yeah, probably everyone knew farming back then, but I think he was a wine merchant. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's a little bit annoying because a lot of people say it the wrong way, but that's okay. Um, you know, it's Give French. it to us again. I liked it. jean Emile Sarissia. Oh, perfect. Does that work all right? <laughs> it does. Uh, Matt, thanks for uh, coming in. Thanks for the communication. Let's keep that up. Absolutely. It's important. Uh, not, uh, look, I'm a rate payer too, and it's important for us to know, and that's why sometimes we ask the hard questions because yeah. we don't often get access to council or councillors or mayors even, and in a unique position like I'm in, you know, it's important to ask those hard questions. So oh, yeah. we, we do appreciate that. And, and I don't see those hard questions, Brett. Any question is a valid question and, mm. and needs to be answered. So I don't see any. It is a hard question. It's just ask the questions. I'll give you the answer with what I know, and if I don't know, I'll go and find out. Perfect. We'll see you in a fortnight, maybe with some more OK questions. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Matt. Matt Dickerson there, Dubbo Reacher Mayor here at Zoo FM. Just on 27 past 8, 8.30 National News Update, just uh, around the corner.